As a business-to-business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long, and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you'll have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You will also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. And they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Here at Sway Group, LinkedIn is a pivotal part of our day-to-day and is just absolutely vital for building relationships with clients and with our employees. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Freelancing and online marketing often looks ideal from the outside, but what's inside? Many time-consuming challenges. SEMrush offers over 50 tools and reports to assist you in every step of your routine, from competitive and keyword research to link building and technical SEO. SEMrush is your digital team member. Let's hit it off. Grab your free trial today and see measurable results. Go to bit.ly slash SEMrushMPN. That's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash S-E-M rush M-P-N. Welcome to the Art of Sway. This is a podcast that brings you inside the world of marketing through the lens of influence. I'm your host, Danielle Wiley. Each week, through candid conversations with industry insiders, we will uncover how influencer marketing is making an impact across all consumer buying habits and is changing the way we talk to each other. Let's dive in. Patrick Hanlon is the author of Primal Branding, the seminal book that uncovers the root code for building authentic brands. Primal Branding is required reading at YouTube. As CEO founder of PrimalBranding.co, Hanlon works with billion-dollar brands and those who want to become billion-dollar brands. Clients have included Google, Levi's, Microsoft, PayPal, PepsiCo, VW, Kraft, Shopify, Time Warner, Upworthy, United Nations, and others. Hanlon has spoken at NYU, Fit, IDEO, H&P Innovation Series, and holds Primal.Live events both virtually and in real life, in China, Europe, South Africa, Argentina, Colombia, and elsewhere. In another life, Hanlon wrote Super Bowl and other commercials for brands famous and infamous. Patrick is a true veteran of the advertising world. I really enjoyed chatting with him about a concept he created called Primal Branding. We touch on all the ways that brands influence or attempt to influence consumers. Please enjoy. Thank you for coming. It's great to have you on. And I'm so glad that our mutual buddy, Lynn, introduced yeah. us. She's awesome. Uh, she's great. I'm happy to be here. It's uh, it's always um, fun to meet new people, new audiences. Well, let's, yeah. like I said, let's start with the easy stuff. It would be great to hear just kind of a synopsis of your journey, how you got to where you are today. I saw in your bio, you said you're the Charles Darwin of branding. So how does how does that happen? <laughs> Huh. <laughs> yeah, someone called me that, I think. I was born in Oceanside, California. I left home when I was about 15. I went back to go to, to finish off school. It took me, I don't know, 20 years or something to get through college. was a writer and in advertising and a creative director. And I happened to uh, fall into a problem that a client was having and had some time to, at that time, people were talking about Nike tribes and the Apple cult and stuff like that, but no one really understood how to make that happen for themselves, other than by imitating Nike and Apple. Uh, We still have, to this day, Gatorade commercials that look like they're 1990s Nike commercials. So Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know that, I mean, I still see everyone trying to be like Apple or Nike. Yeah. They all need your they all need your book. And so um I had some time to figure it out and I did 
And um, so now my book, Primal Branding is what it's called, uh, is required reading at YouTube. And that is to say when corporations or celebrities come in and they want to get a billion views and ask how do they do that, they hand over my book. Apparently they went through a process of trying to figure out if there are any similarities in all of the blockbuster videos with billions of views and the similarities would be found in my book. And so it is required reading there. And But on our own, we have worked with uh, billion dollar companies, billion dollar brands, and those who want to become billion dollar brands. So... So how so you you encountered this client that was struggling mm-hmm. and kind of wanting to be the next Apple or Nike. So talk a little bit more about how how what primal branding is and how this came about and sure. how it well, solved was, that problem for them. Yeah, yeah. This was well documented is well documented, but it, the client was Lego. And at that time and I was a creative global creative director on label, one of several global creative directors, but I was able to go because I was the global a global creative director. I went to Billund, which is where the headquarters is. I went to London, which is what where the European headquarters is. Um, I was in New York. And then I went also to Carlsbad, which is where Legoland is. And so I got a wider perspective on Lego than I suppose a lot of people worked at Lego, right? And I just felt in my gut that there was something really wrong going on. I, I couldn't put my finger on it or articulate it even, but coincidentally, at the same time, the uh, McKinsey consultant was looking at the books and he told the, the family that, Lego's family owned, that uh, if they kept on with what they were doing, they'd be out of business in two years. And so that got their attention and he became CEO of Lego. And, and so what I was feeling from a, I guess, a creative point of view, he was finding in the books, in the numbers, and in the metrics. <laughs> and so the uh, there you had it, the left brain, right brain. And, uh, and so from that, I just asked, but really that situation just forced me to ask myself, why do we really care or really believe and trust in some companies and not in others? So there are a hundred different kinds of jeans we can wear. There are a hundred different kinds of drinks. There are, you know, over 300 kinds of car models to choose from. Why do we believe in certain ones and not in others? And so I wondered if there was a pattern or asked what the similarities were. And they all have logos, you know, I immediately thought of the Nike swoosh and the uh, Starbucks mermaid and uh, Coca-Cola and so forth. And then um, an apple. And then they all have creation stories. Apple was started in a garage you know, think of another one. Google was started in a dorm room. Facebook started in a dorm room. Adam and Eve, of course. <laughs> and the and I just started to build upon that until we had not only where we started, but also what we believe in, you know, whether it's Semper Fi, democracy, you know, believe it that all people are created equal, whether we execute on that is, is a different question. But then uh, how do we identify you? The rituals that we use, you know, Starbucks famously, we all had to stand in line for our coffee and then order with this strange language of ice grande skinny decaf latte. So we all have a lexicon, whether it's just do it or think different or whatever. And, uh, or I, iPads, I this, that, and the other thing. Uh, then there was a group of people that I call non-believers who are, you know, it's Mac versus PC, uh, right. vegans versus carnivores, gas guzzling SUVs versus Teslas, uh, and so forth. Not that they're warring against each other, but the, actually uh, figuring out who does not. You know, the great conceit in marketing is that everyone's going to want us because our product is so wonderful. But in fact, um, it's never wonderful enough that everyone absolutely everyone wants to be with us. And so to acknowledge that there are people out there who don't want to eat meat or don't want gas guzzling SUVs opens up uh, new markets. So it's really a terrific tool for, for strategically figuring out where your white space is. And then there's a leader. And once you combine all seven of these, and it takes all seven of them to, to create truly powerful brand co- to attract truly powerful brand communities. It uh, breaks you away from 
the old hierarchical pyramid of telling people what to think or say about uh, your products or services and or yourself and really building a a bottom-up narrative that helps urge word of mouth. So that's what Primal Branding is about. It's about building communities. And so I started doing this in, I came up with that idea in 2001, in June, July, August. I bounced it off some friends of mine, uh, close friends, so I wouldn't embarrass myself publicly. And they all thought there was something to it. And in August, I just kind of laid low, made some appointments to go into Manhattan in September. And then 9-11 happened and nobody yeah. really cared about a new branding idea. We had different different things going on. So it was just a speech I had. So I would talk about it in in front of people and say that your brand is a community and blah, blah, blah. And there would be hundreds of people staring back at me with X's in their eyes. So it's uh, reassuring (laughs) that today that's become a cliche. So, uh, but the breakout point was in, uh, I went, had a speech and someone came up to me afterwards and asked me if I knew who Rapai was. And I said, yes. And he said, I like his thing. You know, I like your thing. I'm going to put them together and make my own thing. And I told a a friend of mine that, and he said, Pat, you have to write a book. And so after a, a while, a woman named Robin Waters, who was the design director at Target, she said, oh, I can get you an agent. He's, you know, I'm writing a book. I have an agent. And so she introduced me uh, to Jonathan Lazier. And Jonathan said, well, this book will be easy to sell. <laughs> and I laughed because I just spent two, three years, whatever, trying to do it. And uh, of course, he got it done in about two weeks. And so thank you, Jonathan. That's the beauty of an agent, right? <laughs> yeah. Worked with an excellent yeah. editor at Simon Schuster named Fred Hills. His other authors were Nabokov and Seth Godin, and uh, and on from there. So one of the things, and we didn't talk about this in our, kind of our pre-conversation, but it's something that is very interesting to me, and I'd love to get your perspective on it. So this this whole idea, I'm fascinated with Gen Z, and I'm the parent of two, I was going to say kids, but one is an adult. It's a parent of two Gen Zers. And one of them was born right around the time you were coming up with this in 2001. So you had this whole idea before that generation was even talking, doing their thing. And now, of course, they're kind of grown and spending money and engaging with brands. And as you were describing kind of the um, the competitiveness and having the, you know, meat eaters, non-meat eaters, I was mm-hmm. thinking of my son who is so he's like very sports oriented and he refers to everything as rivalries. Mm -hmm. So like Coke and Pepsi are rivals in his mind. It's as, you know, bad as Michigan, Ohio state. Um, (laughs) But it's just very, very interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's very interesting to me to think about how the different, how this impacts different generations, because I feel like each generation, whether it's boomer, Gen X, millennial, Gen Z, now we have Alpha, like they all have their own relationship with brand and the place that it has within their life. And I was wondering how you think, I mean, it seems to me that primal branding can kind of fit into all of those, but even so, do you see a difference with the different generations in terms of how they welcome that into their their own lives? Uh, The thing that I think is true about this is that primal existed thousands of years ago. Someone once told me that I haven't done anything that St. Paul didn't do. No matter how things change, I mean, I came up with this before 2007 and the iPhone, right? Which really, uh, the world sort of had to catch up to what we were talking about and proliferate it, which is what the iPhone did, right? Has done. And so um, so it's just accelerated it so that you can tell your stories and uh, once you identify all of those seven things, by the way, you distribute them across social, digital, and traditional media. And that's St. Paul, I guess, you know, would travel in a boat or walk to different places and tell them the stories and all that. And so it's really a, um, it's not really just a format for storytelling. It, it is that, but it's also a format for how you distribute uh, that story, your story, across whatever media are out there. And uh, today, of course, we have social media and content and so forth. But the so the technologies may may change or evolve, but the technique yeah. or 
foundation format remains the same. The construct remains the same. But do you think that the, I mean, technology aside, it seems to me that like psychologically the different generations welcome brands into their lives in different, in different ways. Like I often say that Gen Z, they kind of expect that everything is sponsored and in our, as such a bit more, there's kind of like a cynicism built into the way that they consume yeah. media. Whereas Gen X, I think being one, like there's, there's more of a trust there and, and kind of like a belief in the authenticity of what people are saying. And it seems to me that those two very differing perspectives when it comes to how they consume media has to have an impact on how they're engaging with brand. Yeah. I think no matter what generation you're a part of, I think you're familiar with, you know, companies trying to claw their ways and their way into your lives. And that's a commonality, but the common denominator probably in a capitalist society, but the popular society. But I think that primal, what primal is really is it is, it's the way our brains work, acknowledging the way our brains work, you know, after a couple million years of brain development or whatever, not to get too spooky about it, but the, (laughs) we have things that icons, for example, you know, which we look at as being the Nike swoosh or, you know, Apple design or Tesla design or whatever things, icons ping all of the senses, sight, sound, taste, smell, touch. And the really things that help us, icons are directly wired to our brains to help us feel safe, alert us if we're in danger, really. Smoke, sirens, things that sting, (laughs) things that don't taste good, you know, and we spit them out. And these are really, and that's where it gets, becomes very primal because once you insert some sort of little earworm into a piece of music, for example, hip hop or, or, or anything, any form of music, we go, oh, what's that? Or a new color, right? And look at all the raging uh, greens, lime greens and oranges that are out there that used to be for safety wear, right? Or now are just t-shirts, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, and jackets and so forth. And uh, they're, alerting us to danger kind of goes away and they become, you know, either a fad or just commonplace all of a sudden. And what used to be an an alarm is now commonplace and doesn't alarm us anymore. So we have to find something else that will attract our attention. And that's why brands need to reconsider uh, those, their icons, you know, whether it's switching out their logo, changing the website or readjusting the packaging, you know, to grab the attention all over again. And Starbucks, I think, I don't know if they do this on purpose or because they're trying to cut costs or whatever they're trying to do, but they're constantly reshaping their their cups, you know, making them wider, smaller, shorter, taller, fatter, whatever, altering the size because people who come every day to Starbucks where Starbucks is a part of your morning routine, feeling that the size and shape of that cup is can become routine, right? Routine equals boring equals yeah. maybe I'll go to Blue Bottle tomorrow or some other place, right? Caribou or someplace, someplace else. And so Dunkin' Donuts, God help us. But the- um, I grew up in New York, so I love a Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> coffee. <laughs> and well, do you remember Chock Full of Nuts? Of course, yeah. Yeah. I remember New York and the only- Starbucks in New York. There was only one Starbucks in New York and it was up just north of Times Square up on Broadway, I think. And and there were still all these chock full of nuts around. They were all retail things around for those who never saw chock full of nuts. And they were everywhere. And I thought, I wonder if someday Starbucks will be as commonplace as a chock full of nuts. And of course they are. Yeah. And chock full of nuts is gone. Yeah. It's amazing how that the retail establishments have that symbolism of, I remember my husband and I lived at 28th and Madison before, way mm-hmm. before that was a cool area to live in. And right before we were leaving, a uh, Blockbuster opened up a block away from our apartment. And like, <laughs> oh man, like this neighborhood's finally getting cool and something's happening here and we're leaving. <laughs> 
Blockbuster. <laughs> yes, Blockbuster, chock full of nuts. Two yeah. ancient brands. Well, yeah. Now that now that we've established that we're both old. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one, I mean, obviously, Sway Group is an influencer marketing agency, and you talk a lot about just kind of the five times that someone has to really hear about a brand before mm-hmm. they'll make a purchase decision, before it kind of sinks in, and and they make that move. What are your thoughts on, I mean, we've talked a little bit about social media, but what are your thoughts on on influencer marketing and and using these uh, kind of, I mean, I guess it's it's nothing new. We've always had celebrity spokespeople, but it's kind right. of just on a much larger scale and a lot more kind of dispersed and out there. More populist. Yeah, it's become more of a populist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, what are your what are your thoughts on bringing these people in? I mean, it's there's a big trust element there because suddenly you're you're losing. There's a certain element of control that you lose when you're letting someone else tell your story and kind of be that spokesperson on behalf of your brand. I mean, obviously, with certainly the way we do influencer, there there is some level of control. Mm-hmm. Clients sure. see content before it goes out. They provide post instructions, key messages, there's all of that. But at the same time, it's it's not the brand telling that story. It's, you know, some kid sitting in his mom's basement or a girl dancing in a parking lot. It's it's it, it's a lot more dispersed than it used to be. Yeah. Well, I think that the, the core of that, of the influencer and of the celebrity cell that we used to do is that it's word of mouth. And you're trying to give someone, have someone who seems sort of like us, recommend the product or service or whatever it is. And so that's what influencer marketing is. And at its core, and word of mouth has always been the strongest form of of advertising, the most powerful form of advertising. And we used to laugh about that (laughs) kind of snidely, because at that time, we couldn't put metrics to it. But now we can. And now that we can, of course, the influencer, if they are genuine and honest and authentic mm-hmm. and not trying to uh, s- scam us older people, brand managers, the, they're great. You know, it's, it's great. And it's, a, as you say, it's uh, people need to, see, just to reiterate what you alluded to, people need to see it. And this is from Edelman PR, a study they did years ago. Uh, people need to see us in five different places in the United States before they are really aware of us and can say, oh yeah, I think I've heard of those people. So in five different places, one of them can be an influencer. One of them can be a Super Bowl spot. One of them can be an outdoor board or an article or just your friend. And really the influencer is taking the role of your friend. Yeah. Right. And just uh, networking theory and, you know, your friend's friend's your friend's friend. Yeah. Friends of friends. Yeah. And, uh, and so their networks become your networks. It's it's so interesting because, I mean, I think it kind of, when I first started doing influencer work, which was kind of before it was a thing and in its infancy, we were treating influencers like journalists and really mm-hmm. think sending them product and hoping they would review it and there was no payment exchanged. And then we kind of realized, you know what? No, it's, they're not journalists, they're spokespeople. And the whole Mm -hmm. industry transitioned to more of a spokesperson model. But what's beautiful about it, I think, is that there's, to your point that they are a friend, I think that's a lot more prevalent and more of a benefit with an influencer than a traditional celebrity, because you, you feel, you feel closer to that person. They're more, yes, they're yeah. more like you. Yeah. Which is right. another Edelman yeah. study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the, um, thank God for Edelman. Yes. And I think there is a distinction between the, the influencer and the more journalistic content mm-hmm. creator who also has, they have, if they're lucky, you know, thousands, tens of thousands yeah. of fans. Yeah. Yeah. Due to their um, either photography, writing, whatever it is. I mean, that it's, what we used to call um, feature writing, mm-hmm. right? And yep. uh, in magazines and so forth. So huge. Yeah. Okay. So this is, we only kind of touched the surface of it. So we're going to put a link to your book and hopefully everyone 
kind of got the bug and and got interested and will buy your book and learn a ton more about primal branding. But before we let you go, um, so we ask all of our guests to share with us. Oh, no. (laughs) Is this the pop question? Yes. (laughs) Okay. So it's the easy one. So what was your favorite commercial as a kid? So not a commercial that you worked on, because we know you worked on a number of those, but like the commercial that sticks with you from your childhood, because I think that was probably one of the first times we were all influenced, really. Yeah. Yes. You asked me about this. I think that it's probably J-E-L-L-O. There's always room for Jello, which I was lucky enough to work with Tony Isidore. Uh, he was older, <laughs> although younger than me now. And I was just a fledgling copywriter in New York. And my first year in New York, I had three different jobs because I just kept asking for raises. Tony wrote, there's always room for Jello at YNR, which used to be a, a, a great agency. Oh, for wow, that's lines, another great one. Yeah. <laughs> and his wife wrote the uh, ring around the collar, which is another great one. Yeah. For, I don't know which detergent do you? Pre- for a detergent. I don't remember which, I mean, <laughs> I remember unnamed. the commercial but the, very vividly and don't remember which brand, which says something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, here's a test. Here's a test. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, but anyway, Tony was great. Yeah. He wrote, there's always room for jello and you know, it. there yeah. always was room for jello. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for joining me and hopefully everyone will go out and buy your book and follow you on social media. And thank you so much again. Thanks for having me. It was terrific being here. You can find Patrick and Primal Branding on social media at at Primal Branding on Instagram, at Hanlon Patrick on Twitter, and Patrick Hanlon on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Please check back next Monday for a new episode featuring marketing conversations through the lens of influence. I am your host, Danielle Wiley, and this is The Art of Sweat. You probably know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? I'm Jason Falls, and I host Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Now, you'll note I didn't say influencer marketing. I said influence marketing. Why? Because the goal is to truly influence an audience to take action. We talk about the strategies and stories that move beyond engaging just social media influencers and tap into your community to find influential voices. It's a different way of looking at it. We call it community commerce marketing. Influencers are still a piece of it, but there's so much more. I talk to creators, brand and agency side marketers, and the thinkers in the space to help grow your business. Come learn with me on Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Find it at winfluencepod.com, marketingpodcasts.net, or search for Winfluence wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.